Chris is an astrophysicist in the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. He's the principal investigator, the lead on Zoom Universe, which is home to the Internet's largest, most popular and most successful um, citizen science projects. In particular, he co-founded Galaxy Zoo, which was, I guess, um, perhaps one of the most popular, an online crowdsourcing project where members of the public could volunteer their time to assist in classifying over a million galaxies. Um, I think it comes into the category of, um, of what people always say about Wikipedia, um, something which works in practice but not in theory, um, something that we just couldn't have imagined um, even, even a, a, a handful of years ago. Um, incredibly popular, it's also produced unique scientific results, um, individual discoveries um, to those using classifications that kind of depend on the input of everyone who's visited the site, so two types of um, crowdsourcing there. Um, I've just a few figures, I'm sure Chris has got even um, better ones now. Uh, volunteers on the first Galaxy Zoo were asked to judge from uploaded images. Um, uh, are both the shape of galaxies and the direction of rotation. Within 24 hours of the site launch, it was receiving almost 70,000 classifications an hour. 50 million classifications received by the project in the first year, um, uh, uh, contributed by 150,000 people. Again, if you'd said that a few years ago, you know, oh, everyone, everyone in the UK is going to get really, or, or in, in the world is going to get really interested. Um, in, in astronomy, um, that would have been like, 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 like a joke. So an incredible thing to happen. Um, Chris is also um, associated with some very, very traditional um, uh, institutions as well. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, he served as Director of Citizen Science at the Adler Planetarium and is the primary presenter of the BBC series, The Sky at Night, um, which anybody British will know is another um, very traditional British institution. His actual research focuses on galaxies, galaxy evolution, and then the application of astrochemical models of star formation to galaxies beyond the Milky Way. Um, and uh, we're really uh, delighted to have him here. Um, he says that um, you can interrupt him while he's going along, but just in case you d kind of don't want to stop him talking or interrupt him, I mean, if, if you don't, but you're free to, um, then we'll, we'll save some time for questions at the end. Really pleased to have you here, Chris. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here as part of this program to make sure astronomers continue to have work. Um, it's great that every conference in Oxford has at least one astrophysics talk. Um, and I hadn't realised if I'd known you were going to give that introduction, I would have just pulled up my slides on astrochemical models, particularly interested in sulphur uh, in the early universe. So um, I'll happily answer questions on that at the tea break, perhaps. Um, no, I think what, what I do want to talk about is what on earth we think we're doing at the Zooniverse. And I'll try, uh, I'll try and be broaden out some lessons. Um, this picture is how we got to where we are. I think this is a reasonable uh, allegory for the state of modern science. We've created some machines, and we don't really know what to do with them, uh, whether you look at ecology or pharmacology or pathology or, or astrophysics. Um, we have machines that produce ridiculous amounts of valuable data. But in many cases, those machines were created without having thought through how to cope with the volumes of data that were coming our way. Uh, and so you see the scientists in a well-organized huddle in the front here uh, dealing with, with the consequences uh, of what they've done. Um, and, and so, as, as you've heard from the introduction, um, one way to solve that problem is to get a bigger mob. That's the movie solution to a robot rampaging through your town anyway. Um, and, and we do that through crowdsourcing. Um, I, I think my definition of crowdsourcing is much narrower than the ones we've just heard. To me, um, it it involves a transformation of information or effort from a distributed crowd to somebody who has set up, set up the challenge, close to the economic definition we heard. So things like MOOCs, well, I think they're fascinating. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about them. Uh, to me, that's less crowdsourcing, more engaging with a crowd. Um, and, and maybe I shouldn't be trying to de define crowdsourcing anyway, because we reject the term. We deliberately didn't use it. Um, it, it sounded like a one-directional thing, certainly in the definition I've just given. Um, you know, we didn't want to think of ourselves as scientists sitting in an ivory tower, sort of handing out the boring bits of the task. 
Uh, and so we adopted this phrase that had been around uh, citizen science, really as an aspirational term. To, we wanted to have uh, our volunteers as a part, full participants in the scientific process. I didn't know until last week uh, where the term came from, but it's recently been added to the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, here's the first use of citizen scientist. It's from an article about UFOs um, in, in 1979 in New Scientist. But I actually think this is good because it highlights that difference, which is that um, there are already issues of scientific authority here. Right? Is it the, scient the professional scientist or the citizen scientist who decides uh, where the value uh, is? Uh, in America, if you go to conferences on this stuff, they're trying to get rid of the term. They don't like citizen science, so you often hear it referred to as PPSR, or public participation in scientific research. But I like the romance of citizen science, uh, and I think we can try and live up to it. So for me... Um, this story really starts with me as a 12-year-old trying to imagine how to make a contribution to science. Um, it's probably not surprising that I was quite a nerdy 12-year-old. I had a telescope of my own, uh, and I desperately wanted to make a discovery. Uh, one evening I was looking at the Orion Nebula, which is the nearest big star-forming region to our own, um, and I nudged the telescope, and this cluster of stars came into view. Um, you could just see the edge of the nebula at the bottom there. And it looked particularly pleasing and somehow striking in the eyepiece. I guess the stars were all about the same brightness. And, and it, it was a really uh, remarkable and spectacular sight. This is before we had the internet at home. So I looked at my star atlas, uh, which is a book, um, which is like the internet, but it doesn't update. Um, and I... Um, it's interesting, different audiences make different noises at that joke. Um, I should do a survey. Um, oh, Helen, we'll collaborate on, on this. Um, but, but anyway, this cluster wasn't there, and I remember marking it in in pencil and calling it Lintot 1, uh, a designation that survived until I got to the library the next day and discovered it is, in fact, NGC 1981. Uh, and I realised that to, to make a discovery, I had to go to university, uh, I had to become a proper astronomer, and proper astronomers don't waste their time looking at individual objects. These days, they use tools like this one, one of the robots that I was talking about with my first slide. This is a telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in New Mexico. It has a mirror a couple of metres across. And for eight years, Sloan just pointed upwards and allowed the sky to turn over it, recording the positions of about 300 million objects as they passed across its camera. And on the best and the clearest and the stillest nights, Sloan went back to a million of those objects that had been classified as galaxies, essentially because they were fuzzy, unlike stars, which are point sources, and recorded their distance. And so the goal of this experiment was to build a three-dimensional map of our local universe. Um, and so this is, we're just going to take a quick journey through uh, about half a million galaxies, about half of the survey. And we'll start on the Milky Way, our own system of a few hundred billion stars, uh, and we'll travel outwards through the Sloan survey. It's always disconcerting. You have to watch the credits before the universe starts. Uh, but nonetheless, here we go. And each dot here is a galaxy, so it's not a star. Each of these is its own system uh, of a few hundred billion stars, what used to be called island universes, uh, which is a much better term than galaxy. Uh, and, and as you get further out, as well as noticing there's quite a lot of space between the galaxies, you start to notice this really quite surprising thing which is that even on these scales in the universe, there is structure. There are places where there are lots of galaxies, and there are places where there are very few. Uh, you see this referred to, on, on, certainly on television and in press releases, as the cosmic web. Uh, but we'll stop in a second and rotate the universe for you, uh, and you get a real sense of this honeycomb structure. And one way to think about what astronomers like me are trying to do uh, is to try and understand why we've got this lumpy universe, uh, and why different types of galaxy live in different places within this uh, lumpy universe. Go on, it's going to rotate. There we go. Um, the bow tie, by the way, is, is distracting. The gap down the middle is just where we haven't surveyed. So that's the modern equivalent of here be dragons. But the structure <laughs> off to the side uh, is real. So if we want to understand these million galaxies, we can either treat them as points and do some sort of statistical model, or we can pay individual attention to every uh, member of this population of galaxies. And when you do that, these are some randomly selected local galaxies, um, you see that they're very different, and they're very different in shape. 
We could call it morphology if you want to sound sophisticated, but it's really the shape of a galaxy that's important here. The shape uh, it's sort of the integrated dynamical history of these galaxies. It tells you about whether they've collided with each other. It tells you about how they've taken on material from their surroundings. And it tells you uh, about when and where they formed stars. So if you only knew one thing about each galaxy, what you'd want to know is the shape. And if you talk to a computer scientist about this, you'll discover that this isn't a uh, formally hard artificial intelligence problem. There's nothing intrinsically difficult about this. It's about the same order of difficulty as teaching your iPhone uh, to recognize your friends in photos, um, something which has taken billions, I suspect, of dollars of funding to get us to where we are now. And we haven't had, sadly, that kind of investment in galaxy recognition. Um, and so... It's, it's tragic. I don't know why you're, you're laughing. Um, but um, if anyone wishes to fund a program on this, it'd be great. It's really easy, it turns out, to get a computer to do 70% of these galaxies correctly. It's really hard. It takes a PhD and a lot of effort to get to about 80%. And beyond that's really tricky. No one's really beaten the 80% barrier. Um, and so when I arrived in Oxford in 2006, there was a student called Kevin Shrewinsky who had looked at 50,000 of these galaxies and recorded their shape. And the first thing that Kevin discovered, well, the first thing he discovered was it really mattered to have a human doing this. So he outperformed uh, senior professors, but he also outperformed uh, computers. Uh, and the second thing we discovered was that a student will do about 50,000 before they tell you where to stick the rest of them. Um, <laughs> But there's also a fundamental problem with this, because even if Kevin had been very dutiful and had spent months going through all million galaxies, um, any results we had would have been subject to the objection that Kevin didn't know what he was doing. Uh, we had no comeback to that. We just had this set of classifications. And so this was an unsatisfactory solution. Uh, and without really thinking about it, um, from Helen's introduction, it seems just as well, because otherwise we would have learned that this wouldn't have worked, um, we created a very quick website called Galaxy Zoo. Um, so it presented an image of a galaxy and six buttons. Uh, if it's an, or, so this was the simplest useful question we could ask about galaxy. Is it an elliptical, a big ball of stars, or is it a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way? And um, There's also a button for mergers and don't know. And we also asked about the direction of the spiral arms, which I'll come back to in two seconds. Uh, and so six choices, an image, you hit a button, you get another image. You hit a button, you get another image. And there was something about that, as you've heard, that attracted a huge number of people. In fact, it attracted people we never expected to be talking to. We thought the audience for this would be amateur astronomers, the kind of people like the 12-year-old me who had their own telescopes and go at night. And I thought I would go to amateur astronomy clubs, uh, give talks, persuade maybe 50 people to do maybe 100 classifications, and we thought in five years we'd work our way through the data. But this had a much broader appeal than that. It ended up on BBC News, on the front page of Wikipedia, uh, and all over the internet. Uh, and we quickly accreted hundreds of millions of classifications. Which is only impressive when I tell you that these classifications were accurate. Taken collectively, and remember we've now got lots of people looking at each image, these classifications were more accurate than Kevin. And they're more accurate than computers, but they're also more accurate than a single expert classifier. And we could check that in all sorts of ways. And one way we, we did an early check that these results were sane was to do with this extra question. We asked which way the spiral arms were turning um, in a galaxy. And, and the direction of the spiral arms tells you about which way the galaxy is turning. So the galaxy at the top in the middle, which matches the one on the left, is rotating clockwise. And the galaxy on the other side is rotating anti-clockwise, or counterclockwise, if you're American, I guess. Um, and there was a crazy paper, well, there was a, let's call it a provocative paper, uh, which had been released a few months before Galaxy Zoo by a guy called Michael Longo, who had looked at 3,000 of these galaxies, and he said he could see more anti-clockwise galaxies than clockwise galaxies. So in other words, he said there was a bias in the universe. So something about the universe made galaxies more likely to spiral one way than the other. And this is a result that made no sense whatsoever. Uh, you either have to invent a universal magnetic field that we've somehow uh, avoided detecting until now, um, or if you go and talk to the theorists, they start saying things about the universe being small and shaped like a donut, which is a clear sign of desperation uh, <laughs> from a cosmologist. Um, and, and so this result made no sense, but he only had 3,000 galaxies. 
The statistical weight isn't there. And we thought this was the equivalent of tossing a coin twice, getting two heads and concluding there were heads on both sides. So we very quickly had a couple of hundred thousand galaxies, hundred th sorry, a couple of hundred thousand spiral galaxies, which we knew were spiral because lots of people had looked at them. And we discovered that there were more anticlockwise galaxies than clockwise. So there appeared to be this bias in the universe. And just before we wrote our nature paper and sent off to Stockholm to claim that we'd discovered <laughs> the, probably the most surprising result in cosmology for 50 years, um, we just flipped all the images on the website. So we were now showing people the mirror image of these galaxies. And if this result had been real, we would now be seeing more clockwise than anticlockwise galaxies. But we still got more anticlockwise <laughs> than clockwise galaxies. And so one way to put this is it's not the universe that's odd. <laughs> It's us. There's something about the way humans look at these images that make it easier to see spiral arms when they're anti-clockwise. Uh, and the closest analogy I've got is called the ballerina illusion, so uh, a bit of crowdsourcing. So if you imagine you're looking down on this dancer, how many of you see her rotating clockwise? This is also peer pressure. How many people see her rotating anti-clockwise? Okay, first of all, it's odd we don't agree. Um, secondly, how many people have seen her switch? If you want to see a switch, if you rotate your head like that, it doesn't have any effect, but it amuses me. So, uh, But what's going on here is this is a two-dimensional image which your brain is interpreting as part of a three-dimensional world, and it's changing its mind about how to project this image into 3D. And if you integrate over a lot of people and a lot of time, then you find there's a bias. Yeah, there's a preferred direction. And we were seeing the same thing with static images. And I could be saying anything now because you're all looking at this slide. Uh, and I've often thought I could go and get a cup of tea at this point. Um, anyway, the point here is that once we were able to measure this effect by showing the mirrored images, we could adjust for it. It was incredibly subtle. But we were able to find even this subtle effect, adjust for it, and show that the universe doesn't uh, have this bias on large scales. And so this sort of thing, and I, this is the point where I could start listing galaxies as scientific achievements. I'm not going to do that. It would take far too long. Uh, but just to say that we got a bit more ambitious, so we also employed a designer. Um, so new <laughs> versions look a bit better. Um, we've gained a slogan, as you can see. Uh, but new current versions of Galaxy Zero, if you go there now, ask a complex decision tree of questions. So we're still not teaching people about galaxies. I'm not trying to tell you all what I would consider an SA3 spiral or something like that, uh, but we are able to break down the classifications to questions like, is there a bulge at the centre of the galaxy? If so, what shape is it? Is there a bar there? How many spiral arms are there? And so on and so forth. Um, I'm just going to get galaxies. I don't know where I'm going to put this, but this could get interesting. Of course... You know, I need to remind myself that system design is important here. Uh, and sometimes, with crowdsourcing, you get what you ask for. So one of the types of galaxy that we were interested in was a disturbed galaxy. So these are sort of, sometimes you get big train wrecks, merging galaxies, galaxies which have collided with each other. Sometimes you get sort of a submerger, a small galaxy ploughing into a big one, and you get a, a disturbance in the regular structure of, say, a, a spiral disk. And so this nice little uh, icon was supposed to represent disturbed, uh, and here's what we got back. Um, these are indeed <laughs> good matches to the picture, but these are places where a pixel died on the camera. <laughs> um, so this is an accurate but utterly useless classification um, and was the result of not testing properly. And so, but that, slight mishaps like this aside, at this point, we'd got to a site that could scale to the size of modern data sets. We could do our classification, crowdsource, if you like, our classification to citizen scientists um, and get back hundreds of millions of classifications. So we discovered the first advantage of this was our ability to scale. But there's another strange thing that happens when you let people loose in the data set. Uh, and it's a consequence of the fact that the crowd, uh, both of galaxies and of people, isn't utterly um, regular. It isn't um, composed of identical people. Uh, there are individuals in the crowd. Uh, this is a typical Galaxy Zoo volunteer. 
Uh, actually, uh, to be fair to him, this is Brian May, of course, who's not typical. He has an astrophysics PhD, uh, which at the time that we were launching Galaxy Zoo, he was just finishing off. He'd gone back to Imperial College after 30 years um, and was, was getting back into academic astronomy. Um, and so he wrote on his blog about Galaxy Zoo, creating a long-lasting bias in the musical tastes of our volunteers, which persists <laughs> to this day, um, but also bringing in another crowd of people who would never have thought to consider themselves astronomers or to take part in an astronomy project. And amongst them was this lady. This is Honey Van Arkel, who has the same guitar as Brian. Um, she's a biology, or was a biology teacher in the Netherlands. Um, and she was the first person to see this thing. And what's nice about this is I think it really neatly illustrates the difference between humans and automatic detection routines. Remember, the main task is classify galaxies. And so if I have the world's best neural net for this stuff, and it's going through and classifying galaxies, then it may just be able to tell me that there's a spiral galaxy in the center of this image. You can just see the spiral arms. There's something of a dust lane in there as well and a bright nucleus. But it's basically a spiral. But if you're a human, if you're wonderfully distractible, as so many of us are, what you're wondering is why there's a blue blob sitting underneath the galaxy. And that's exactly what Honey uh, asked. She called it, the, and apologies to Dutch speakers in the room, uh, uh, the, she called it a vorwerp, which we thought was a technical term, so we adopted it. Uh, it means, as I think some of you know, um, something like thingy or object, but it's now in the literature as Honey's vorwerp. And this is an image of it with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's a really unique object. It's a galaxy-sized cloud of gas um, about a distance of 300 million light years away, uh, heated to 50,000 degrees by a jet coming from uh, activity associated with a black hole in this nearby galaxy. Uh, I could happily spend the next 40 minutes telling you why this is really exciting. Uh, but for now, let the fact that we got an image of it with the Hubble Space Telescope stand for the fact that astronomers think this is interesting. We have to compete for time on Hubble, uh, and it was really exciting to be able to get this image. So serendipitous discovery is a natural consequence of getting the crowd to engage with a large data set. It's not just that the task that we set them scales. It's that every individual image has somebody or some set of people look at it and they can get distracted and interested in things that you never thought to ask. We see that pattern again and again and again. And the Vorwerp is just one example. You can also imagine sort of serendipitous creation of research projects. So Honey became a celebrity, uh, certainly in, in Holland. Um, as a result of this discovery, she woke up with TV cameras on her doorstep because she discovered this galaxy um, or this strange object. And we flew her all the way to Seattle to, to come to the American Astronomical Society. She was so excited by meeting about 3,000 astronomers. Uh, I don't know if you've had the experience, but I recommend it. Um, but the, the, the other people in Galaxy Zoo started to get excited as well. And of course, they wanted to discover Vorwerpen of their own. Um, and so here's a catalogue. None of these are quite as bright as the Vorwerp, which is in the bottom left, but every blue cloud in these images we call Vorwerpes, which is the diminutive. Um, it's amazing what you learn doing this stuff. Um, the, the blue clouds here are all energized by interactions with activity around the black holes at the center of these galaxies. Uh, and it's become a new way to study this kind of activity. Um, and it's so exciting that we went back and we got Hubble Space Telescope images of these things as well. And these haven't been released yet, but this is to say that they're complex and wonderful and interesting. But we didn't know they were there until somebody with their own research agenda, I want to find a Volverp, I want to be like Annie, I want to meet all these astronomers, went back into the data with that question in their minds, a question that the site doesn't ask and that the, 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 the astronomers didn't pose. And so as well as scale, serendipity and this kind of sort of human distraction and ferreting out of new questions is, I think, a key part of what makes this kind of crowdsourcing uh, almost uniquely powerful. It's not just that humans are naturally good at pattern recognition. It's that we are hypothesis-generating machines and we can go through and we can form our own questions, the data sets, even if we're not expert astronomers to begin with. The other unexpected thing that happened when we got uh, this far into Galaxy Zoo 
was that we started hearing a lot from other scientists, not just astronomers, but other people who'd run into this problem of having too much data. And we realized that if you've built the software architecture needed to sustain Galaxy Zoo, it doesn't really matter what you're classifying. And so to jump forward a few years, just last week, we launched a site called Penguin Watch. You'll notice that we've strayed a little way from astronomy. Um, Penguin Watch is a collaboration with the Department of Zoology here. It's, uh, it will cross its half millionth image uh, today, a week after its launch. Uh, and Penguin Watch needs you to count penguins. Uh, so this is an example of penguin counting. Um, believe it or not, the old way of doing this was to send a PhD student to Antarctica <laughs> to count penguins. These days, the PhD student can be equipped with a whole set of cameras. Uh, and in fact, the guys who do this, the guys and girls who do this, um, hitch rides on cruise ships and get dropped off, put their cameras up, and then they come back four months later uh, and collect a few million images. Uh, taken every five minutes of these penguins. And monitoring the health of these colonies is a key indicator uh, of the response of Antarctica to climate change, as well as being uh, of interest to other uh, to, to, to behavioural scientists as well. Um, every time I see this video, I'm reminded that our original idea for this project called it uh, Penguin Hunters. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> the, the biologists were very happy with us. Anyway, this is hugely successful, and Penguin Watch is producing good results. And between Galaxy Zoo and Penguin Watch, uh, we now run a site, the Zooniverse, um, which supports 30 uh, projects, many of them astronomical, uh, but many of them not. So to give some examples, I'm going to go through them all. Uh, Snapshot Serengeti was our first camera trap project. So this was motion-sensitive cameras in the Serengeti for a bunch of researchers who were looking at the interaction of carnivores. Uh, we did Bat Detective, an audio project, trying to listen in to, I'm not joking, bats in Transylvania, uh, which we thought would go down quite well. Uh, more astronomy, the Andromeda project in the bottom right uh, lasted a week before the combined efforts of the crowd had exhausted the world's largest survey of our nearest uh, neighboring big galaxy. Uh, one of the nice things about that is it, that one of the tasks was to look for clusters of stars uh, so I have now discovered a cluster of stars, uh, along with 10 other people uh, who saw that image, but they won't let me call it Lintot 1, but it's still there. Uh, and we've even done things like, this is Cyclone Center in the bottom left, which was historical hurricane imaging, looking at whether hurricanes have strengthened over the 20th century. So these all share a platform. They look very different. They have their own identities and their own communities within the Zooniverse umbrella, but uh, they are... Uh, all on the same platform. And that platform, uh, that, that sharing that platform means that these projects have sort of things in common. One of the things in common is that they can scale because of the architecture that we've built extremely rapidly. This is not a technical talk. If you want to know about how we do this, uh, then come and talk to me at the break. Um, but we did an annual, we do a project with the BBC, which Brian Cox looks straight down the camera and says, go to this Zooniverse website. In this case, try and discover a galaxy. This is January. We got more than a million classifications in an hour uh, on a single project. Would have been more, except we forgot that 20,000 people were going to reset their password at the same time. Uh, but we've got that for next year. Uh, this platform can scale, and large amounts of effort could be um, pointed uh, at projects with the assistance of some traditional media. I've also talked about these projects being natural experiments. This is sort of a, an interesting diagram, perhaps only if you're us, uh, but the number of visitors versus the average time on site. And you can see we're beginning to get some predictive power as to where things will sit on this. There are some very popular projects. Galaxy Zoo and Planet Hunters have had repeated successes and therefore have gained a lot of media and they, they're in a different place. Operation War Diary was new when this was taken. So it was abnormal. And there are some failing projects down at the bottom. Cyclone Center's very hard. People don't like audio projects, so Bat Detective is, is low down. But there's this sort of main sequence uh, where most of our, our projects sit. And so we can begin to say from testing what sort of effort we should expect. And that effort is typically split uh, between new users and experts. <coughs> this is a diagram showing the, the contributions uh, of a few thousand volunteers to Galaxy Zoo 
the size of each, the colors are random, the size of each box uh, is the effort of a single classifier. And it's a vague rule of thumb for our projects. About half the effort comes from committed, hardcore volunteers who've really decided that Galaxy Zoo, in this case, is something they're going to do. And the other half comes from people who are there maybe once or twice. And we try and combine both sets of effort. We try and design for both sets of things being useful. I think that the projects would fail if we didn't have a way to make the people who only turn up once or twice feel useful. I don't think any of them would then convert to being uh, committed Galaxy Zoo classifiers. But equally, of course, if you stay flat, I don't think you ever gain this sort of community. And so we spend a lot of our time thinking about these different modalities, about these two different ways of interacting with the site. And we know a little now about the motivations of these people as well. Because it was frankly surprising that these people in the top left have looked at hundreds of thousands of galaxies. Even Kevin, the PhD student who was being paid to do this, on whose entire future career depending on classifications of galaxies wouldn't do more than 50,000. And yet lots of these people would. And when we interviewed them, and when we surveyed them, even way back at the beginning, what they told us was that they did this because they wanted to make a contribution to science. It wasn't quite that they wanted to discover a star cluster. It wasn't quite that they were already interested in astronomy. I found a few of those people. Um, but about half of them said that their major motivation was wanting to contribute to science. And I thought, I've stood on many stages and given that statistic for years without ever really believing it. Because that's the kind of thing you say when you're asked by the eminent scientists from wherever, why are you doing this project? You don't say, oh, I was just pissing about on the internet and, you know, it was better than solitaire. You say, no, I wish to contribute to science. <laughs> Except that we now have actual evidence that I believe in that Snapshot Serengeti, which is one of our most popular projects, you know, I feel we've proved that people like looking at pictures of animals on the internet. Um, <laughs> Snapshot Serengeti keeps running out of images. We get about between one and two million images every six months back from the field, from the biologists, um, and that will last somewhere between two days and two weeks, depending on how busy. And that's multiple people looking at each image. Um, and so when that happens, we put up this little green box that says, with your help, we've classified all of the data we have so far. Great work. We're leaving the images up for further classifications, but we're basically not going to use them. And the addition of that green box and no other changes to the site cuts our traffic by a factor of about 100. And so people who are told that this isn't going to be useful for science go away. And then they come back when we put new images up. So we have a community that really cares. They aren't, we've been using the word tourist for someone who's just there for the images. These are people, it really matters to them that there's an authentic use of those images. And I think that's, a, as I'll go on to, to say, I think that's a, the first of the broader lessons we can derive for whatever sphere of crowdsourcing, that the authenticity of this is important. It isn't just a bit of fun, although Snapshot Serengeti is great fun, um, says the astronomer. Uh, but, but people really care that this is real. Just to add it aside, just as I was listening to that excellent panel, um, just to say that those motivations don't always translate into economic ones. And so uh, the team... Where did the water go? Oh, thanks. Sorry, thanks. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Sorry. It's very hot up here. And this is very exciting stuff. Thanks. Um, also, I'm talking about the Serengeti, so there's obviously a psychological thing going on. Um, and 50,000 degree glass clouds and stuff. Uh, anyway, um, the researchers who provide the data for Snapshot Serengeti have been funded by the National Science Foundation in the States for 30 years, and then they missed one of their grants. They got turned down. And so they had a gap of funding, and they wanted to keep this continuous monitoring uh, alive. And so we thought we could help out. We have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are engaged with their project to the extent that they'll give their free time. So surely we can just do crowdfunding. And we did. We used Indiegogo. Uh, we provided some frankly excellent rewards. You could have your own hyena mangled camera. Uh, <laughs> 11 people went for this award, just in case you're keeping track, which means I have lots left, should anyone want one. Um, but it was really tough. 
I mean, we hit the, the first target, which was $30,000, and maybe we could have done things differently, and maybe we could have, it's better, but even with a large audience of already engaged people, and a banner stuck across Snapshot Serengeti, and our ability to email people to say, you gave your free time, why not give us $2? It was really tough to convert, and very uncomfortable, to try and convert volunteering into economic uh, donation. And, and I think that should be something we bear in mind. It's, it's certainly not an experiment we want to repeat in the near future. We'll do it if we really need the money, I guess. Uh, but it wasn't easy, and it felt very uncomfortable. Um, our reach is worldwide, but not great. Uh, that's a reasonably good... This is the distribution of Zooniverse volunteers, um, as recorded by Google Analytics. Um, it's a reasonably good population density map of Europe and the US, uh, certainly North America. We're poor in the rest of the world, and we've just begun to translate our sites, to crowdsource the translation of our sites to try to improve that. And the early signs are uh, that that's having an effect. And another thing we see that's in common between our projects is that we see learning happening. So the original Galaxy Zoo didn't tell you anything about galaxies. In fact, it didn't tell you what a galaxy was. Um, it just said, classify these images, and astronomers will, will use them. Um, we have a project called Seafloor Explorer. It's looking for at the health of fisheries off uh, the north coast of the US, also the northeast coast of the US. Um, and this is an analysis of um, terms used in the uh, Seafloor Explorer's forum. And on the left column, you've got the most common words, or the most com common word roots, rather, um, in the first 10% of comments made after the project launched. And then on the right, uh, you've got the most common <laughs> uh, word roots used uh, in the last 10%. As so on the most recent when this paper was written. Uh, and so there are two conclusions to draw from this. One is that this project has caused a group of users to learn an awful lot uh, about the technical vocabulary and background to this project. In fact, most of the technical terms on the right here are not used anywhere on the site. So it's not even that they just carefully read the Seafloor Explorer site. This community has been mot become motivated to go out and learn. And we can show that in many of our projects. That's excellent, because I'm not asking you for funding. I'll also point out the second point, which is that this is a failing community because this is a community that has become dominated by the small group of expert users. There's no longer a constant influx of new volunteers to dilute this. And if we want to think about building sustainable communities, while we, I showed that map of all the squares, the main interface is happily receiving classifications from new users and advanced users. The discussion around this project has become dominated by advanced users to the exclusion of all else. And so there's some interesting community dynamics uh, that we're trying to, to deal with here. So let's skip on. It's not just in the communities where we can take people as, as individuals, though. One of the directions we're going is to try and make this process more efficient. At present, everything I've said treats every classifier to hit Galaxy Zoo or Seafloor Explorer or Snapshot Serengeti as equally capable. And we know that's not going to be true. So more recent projects, this is one called Space Warps. This is the one we did with the BBC this year. Um, this is a, a search for distant galaxies. It turns out that if you have two galaxies that happen to be precisely in line, as seen from our perspective on Earth, then the light from the more distant galaxy will be bent by its passage near the nearby galaxy. And it produces this little arc that you can see in the circle down there. That uh, is a lensed image sort of nature's telescope uh, magnifying a very distant galaxy. And that sort of pattern recognition is also best done by people. But here we have simulated lenses. Call them fake if you prefer, but that gets people angry. But simulated lenses so that we can measure how well people are doing. And here's the behavior of 50 randomly selected volunteers. On the x-axis, the bottom here, is the probability that they're going to say there's a lens there when there's a lens there. On the y-axis, the probability they'll say that there's nothing there when there's nothing there. Uh, so you could sort of imagine top right are the best classifiers. We'll call them astute. Uh, on the left, you have pessimists who never see anything. On the right, you have optimists who always say there's something there. And in the bottom left, you've got, we'll call them obtuse users, 
uh, but people who are wrong all the time. <laughs> and you start to get some in interesting consequences, one of which is that people who are wrong all the time, if you know they're wrong all the time, are just as useful as people who are right all the time. <laughs> some of you may employ this in your daily lives. Uh, but that, that's interesting, because as long as we know, so we've measured that, so that's good. But then should we teach those people? By trying to get them to improve, they actually become less useful to us. Yeah. So you can have all sorts of strange pub debates about this. And you can also imagine starting to make strategies. So what if I have an image, two people have looked at it, and we think, both of them think there's something there. Maybe I should show that to a pessimist. And if the pessimist thinks there's something there, then I can be really sure. Uh, and you can start, in fact, you can write down the equations, and you can start to come up with a way of assigning tasks so that we get the maximum information out of the crowd. Uh, that's been done. It's been done for, for lots of our projects. Uh, and for example, oh, this hasn't come out at all. But if you go and look at this paper, which is by Tamsin Waterhouse from Google, she took the Galaxy Zoo 2 results and she did exactly this sort of uh, task assignment and showed she could get the same result with only 10% of the classification. So the same accuracy of result, but with only 10% of the classifications. And as data sets get larger, or we start thinking about live data streams, we've been thinking about how to apply this sort of stuff to disaster relief, where you want to look at satellite images very quickly, then this kind of efficiency will be very important. And what's nice is that once you start deciding which humans to assign classifications to, it's easy to bring a computer into the mix as well and to make a decision about whether to pass a particular image based on what you know about it to humans or to computers. Or at least that works fine if your humans are not volunteers. This is the thing that the computer scientists never have to worry about. If you use an algorithm that's used to assigning tasks to different automated agents, you don't have to worry about them buggering off to Facebook uh, or going back to their day jobs or, or heaven forbid, shutting the internet down, uh, reading a book or something. Um, imagine that we build a system that assigns each of you the task, let's say on Galaxy Zoo, that you're best suited for. You get the sp spiralist galaxies, you get the nearby ones, you get the distant ones, and you get the faint, fuzzy ones. That's great, unless you're there because you like looking at nice, beautiful images of galaxies. And I feed you an unremitting diet of difficult stuff, and I've ruined the experience. In fact, I've built a system that will systematically drive away my best classifiers. Um, and so you end up finding yourself having to detect motivation. You have to understand what it is that people are getting out of this experience in order to be able to efficiently assign tasks. You have to think, perhaps, that people are, are, are developing narratives about what they're seeing. And you have to provide enough fodder for a story as well as for efficient scientific classification. And doing that automatically is really hard. Uh, and it's great fun, and we're, and we're spending a lot of time thinking about that. There is a way out that people would often try and sell you to this, which is that we have ignored the major developments, certainly, from, from games. You know, nothing I've talked about, I haven't given people points or badges or external incentives to keep classifying. I've just said, you all want to do science, here's an image of a galaxy, here's something from the Serengeti, here's a picture of the seafloor. And there have been very successful citizen science projects that frame themselves as games. And the best known of those is probably Fold It. Fold It is a puzzle game um, where you take these three-dimensional structures which are representative of proteins uh, and you fold them to find the lowest energy states. Uh, it's a beautifully clever uh, game in that all of the chemical intuition you need to understand this problem is in the mechanic of the game. So uh, if you can't have two hydrogens at more than 60 degrees uh, close to each other, you can't have the angle between them at less than 60 degrees, then the tool you use to move the hydrogens is a spanner that only moves at that sort of uh, angle. It's really impressive, and the results they've had have been great. Uh, I wish that the person giving the instructions wasn't a white guy with glasses in a white coat, but never mind. Um, Fold It's been incredibly successful, and they're successful partly because they can give you a score which is inversely proportional to the current energy state of your protein. Um, so this is very effective. They have lots of people playing this, and at any one time there are between 10 and 50 advanced users working on genuinely novel chemical problems through the medium of this game-like interface. 
can imagine simple problems as well. One of my favourites, this one from the humanities, was the Finnish National Library, uh, who built a project called uh, uh, Digital Kut, but Mole Bridge was the name of the game. Here's, here it is in action. Um, the moles move from left to right. And the only way to save them is to build a bridge out of words extracted from Finnish newspapers, because uh, they were digitising their entire newspaper collection. Um, and you do that using this keyboard at the bottom. And what's really nice, so you see the end cloud there, you're trying to get them to their sweetheart in the top right. Um, the psychology of this is desperate for study, by the way. Um, but the little pink cloud at the end, what's really nice about this is when you input a word, you get a pink cloud, and it's only when it's confirmed by someone else does it turn into a proper permanent piece of the bridge. And if they disagree with you, then it disappears and your moles plummet to their death, making an aggressively nasty sound, uh, and thus training you to do this well. So, so games can exist, but gamification, I think, is troubling. I think you can play these games and you, you choose to play these games because they're fun, not because you want to make a contribution to the Finnish National Library's digitization project. Um, although that being said, they, they did actually digitize the entire newspaper collection. Adding in little bits of gamification can ha do strange things to people's motivations. We actually did it. We had a project with uh, the SETI Institute. Um, so we were actually crowdsourced looking for aliens. Um, I sadly don't have time to justify that, but it was a sensible choice. And um, we had all these badges. You know, you've, look, you've classified for five days in a row. You've detected a potential signal. You looked at a, a star with a known planet, um, and, and so on and so forth. And these badges existed, and they rewarded behavior. And we actually built a badge for you have detected an alien, uh, which would have been the event of an alien detection was going to be automatically posted to Facebook. Uh, so that's how the world would have known. Uh, it was never used. Um, but we found that this, the, the, the getting this stuff right is hard. So, for example, we gave a badge for 25 classifications. We found, indeed, that lots of people got to 25, and then they all left. And the hit we took for people leaving was much greater than the hit we took the, the, the benefits of giving this badge. So this stuff is hard. We've done it elsewhere where as well. We had a project called Old Weather. We have a project called Old Weather, which involves transcribing logbooks that look like this. Every four hours, uh, the Royal Navy take weather observations. If you go back before 1920, these are intensely valuable to climate scientists who are trying to uh, reconstruct the world's weather patterns. Um, but the task basically consists of typing in numbers. It's not hugely exciting. And so if you join Old Weather, you're assigned to the crew of a ship. You get a rank. You're a captain or a lieutenant and so on. Uh, and clearly, depending on how many classifications you've done, you rise in rank through the ship. Perfectly standard, off the shelf. Anyone in Silicon Roundabout will sell you this as an essential tool for your academic crowdsourcing project. And then we studied the volunteers. In fact, somebody called Alexander Everly at UCL interviewed lots of the volunteers, and this is a fairly typical comment. Um, the reactions we got were people saying, yes, it did motivate me, but I found it stressful because I'm a competitive person, and when I wanted to be captain of a ship, I wanted to stay there at any cost. And I'm reminded of, there's a quote from Jay Hanlon, who founded Stack Overflow, who use a lot of this sort of gamification and badges to get programmers to talk to each other. And he said, in the history of the world, gamification has never gotten a single person to do anything they didn't already basically like to do. I think that's true. I think if you're committed to uh, trying to lose weight or, or trying to uh, be efficient at work, then giving yourself points and checking in on an app can work. I think when we're trying to convince people that they can make a contribution to science, you're not going to do that by giving them a digital badge that they didn't care about. The experience has to be real and authentic. And it matters because we are trying to persuade people to do things that they don't think they can do. You can see that evidence in the gender split of our volunteers. So this is, these are guesses at the male to female split estimates, really, in three of our projects, with participation and then classification on the right. So that's a uh, number of people and then amount of work. Um, and th we, this is based on assuming that the first names of our volunteers have the same uh, gender split as they do in the US census. So it's a reasonable guess, I think. And what we can see is that we, uh, our volunteers, especially in the astronomy projects, uh, are dominated by men. Uh, not as bad as, say, 
the subscription rate to astronomical magazines, which is about 96% male. But nonetheless, we, 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 do, we don't have an even split. And my guess is that this is something to do with people feeling empowered to do something real, to take part in science. The, you can do real science is both exciting, it's the thing that keeps people coming back to our projects, but it's also a barrier to entry. Because if you're the kind of person who goes, oh, I was useless at science at school, then being told you're about to do real science is really tricky. And, and one of the projects mentioned here is Cell Slider. It's a collaboration with Cancer Research UK, which uses their slogans, which say things like, together we can cure cancer. Which, if you don't believe it, is sort of an inspiring platitude. But if you actually believe that you're being asked in three minutes in your lunch break to cure cancer you'd be forgiven for going off and doing something slightly less stressful. And I think we see the highest bounce rate of all, any of our projects on cell slider because I think we're intim intimidating people. The issue is linked, I think, to something that I've come across from the museum world, which is the, particularly with art galleries, have, which have this beautiful, these beautiful imposing porticos. Um, there's this idea of threshold fear. The idea that no matter what this gallery or any other gallery does with its exhibitions, with its labelling, with its content, to open up to a diverse audience, you're not going to go in unless you already believe that you're the kind of person who can get something out of being in an art gallery. It's a choice that lots of us make, but you have to get over that hurdle. I think we're seeing that online. We're seeing a population of people who have to be convinced that they can make a contribution of science, to science before... They can be inspired and excited by the fact they have made a contribution to science. Perhaps it's a trite point. Perhaps it's cyclic. But I, I genuinely think we're coming up across, uh, coming across this again and again and again. Which brings me to politics. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say... You know, you'll have noticed I've strayed a, a long way through psychology and, and, and computer science and so on. Uh, and in some sense, the Zooniverse has been... Uh, a seven-year experience of discovering other academic fields I'm supposed to know about. Um, and if I'd known that all of this existed, there's no way I would have started Galaxy Zoo. Uh, but I thought I would say something about how I think all of this relates to political efforts to use crowdsourcing. Um, of course, as somebody's already re remarked, some, some sense democratic politics is crowdsourcing. This is a well-designed crowdsourcing experiment. The question is understandable. There are small numbers of choices, and you're not required to understand all the implications behind this question to answer. You know, you could, this is almost the same as does this galaxy have spiral arms or not? Um, but yet, there, there seems to be a desire. Clearly, this doesn't quite get to more complicated or more interesting problems. And so, there have been all of these attempts to try and do different forms of crowdsourcing. The, the famous ones, I think. And there will be people in the room I know who know much more about this, but the ones that, that I know about are sort of the petitions, both in the US and the UK, that if you can get 10,000 or 100,000 uh, signatures, get an official response. Uh, the example I'm using here is the official response to the plea, one of the most successful US petitions, which is the plea to create the Death Star by 2016. Um, and they say, you know, it's too expensive. Uh, we don't really want to blow up planets, and it can be destroyed by a one-man starship anyway, so it's a bad use of resources. Um, in the UK, there was Nick Clegg's um, Freedom Campaign, from what feels like many years ago. Uh, you know, your freedom is the part of the most radical shake-up of our politics for decades. And this was where they wanted people to say which laws would they like to remove, and they got very low rates of participation. Um, and um, what was there was dominated by single-issue campaigners rather than a genuine... Uh, engagement with the, the kind of crowdsource problem that they were after. So maybe they're using the wrong tools. After all, I've just spent most of an hour talking about the tools we built for scientific content. People have done more complicated things. There are lots of examples of people trying to use GitHub, you know, a version control system for policy development. This is a guy called Dave Cole who rang for Congress uh, and put his entire platform on GitHub so anyone could fork it, make changes, um, could contribute to his platform, um, four people did, two of whom worked for him, uh, and he didn't get through the primary. Um, San Francisco has its entire um, civil code online. You have to go through a slightly strange process in which you have to tell them that you understand that if you change things in this repository, then that's not the same as changing the law in San Francisco, uh, and that you won't tell anyone else that it is. Uh, but nonetheless, it's there. But despite that, in a quite swish website, uh, there have been very low levels of engagement 
with this sort of thing. And I think what's going on here is that we're missing that first stage of engagement. Galaxy Zoo and projects like it work because the first thing you do, you classify a galaxy, you see an image on the Serengeti, once you've got over threshold fear, is convincing as a contribution to science. You can understand the consequence of having classified that galaxy. Sometimes that's scary. Like, why am I classifying a galaxy? But and sometimes you need to be reassured that we know that that will be accurate or that other people will come along and look too. But there's that small thing that feels convincing, which can then be built into broader engagement. And these sort of platforms and these sorts of efforts, it seems to me, have never really managed to identify that small thing that feels meaningful. Even the act of signing a petition, which, OK, is a small act, doesn't really add up to much. It doesn't feel like an authentic contribution when most of the petitions are at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 signatures. Uh, and the responses that come, that you can see have come from similar petitions, tend to be fairly offhand. I think it's a struggle to point to, certainly in the UK or US, at real political change that's come from uh, any of those large efforts. But I think we can begin to imagine problems where you might try and build a sort of Galaxy Zoo, Zooniverse-esque political crowdsourcing platform. And I was very struck by, uh, I don't know if people know this book, it's Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air by Dave McKay, um, who uh, was a, a physicist uh, at the Cavendish in Cambridge, uh, and an advisor to the government on climate change. Um, and the whole book is online. And it's a really straightforward sort of physicist book about estimating where our energy might come from. You know, what are reasonable assumptions to make about whether we'll unplug our mobile phone chargers? What are reasonable assumptions to make uh, when it comes to electric transport? What are reasonable assumptions to make when it comes to renewables contributing to the UK energy mix? And what are reasonable assumptions for what we need to do to uh, ameliorate the worst effects of, of climate change? And so it ends up, after a couple of hundred really readable pages, you end up finding yourself scribbling on the side of a, uh, a fag packet or a beer mat. Neither of those sound very sustainable. On the side of a piece of recycled paper, um, <laughs> back of an envelope or something. Um, and you start working out, well, you know, if we have these wind farms, then we'll need this much nuclear power, and we'll need to cover the Sahara... Or, or whatever it is. And, and the point of the book is that there aren't easy solutions that come out of that. But I can imagine a collective of people who have this shared understanding of the problem at this sort of numerical level, who can then crowdsource a solution to this problem. The problem is that I know how to get somebody to come to a website, see a picture of a galaxy and tell me what they see. I don't know how to sustain that attention while they read 200 pages of a reasonably technical, if well-written book. Uh, and I'm delighted if any of you have the solution. Thank you very much.